switch gears a little and uh, be a little specific. Uh, as Africans, and, and this is not a general life thing, but one of the things I've seen among several of my African brothers and sisters who in ministry will come here and maybe are wanting to do ministry. The tendency is uh, to focus only on Africans. And I know there are people that God has called to the diaspora, whether it's wherever, North America, Europe, and God has called them to just reach the Africans in those areas. There are people with those specific kinds of calling. But I also know that there are times when uh, there are Africans will come and that is the focus, not because uh, God is the one leading them, but it's like, that's what I'm comfortable with. What would you say to that? What would you? Well, I, I, th I think. You want to you yes. Because I know you might have more to say on this. Um, I, I think you have said it well, Velma. It's comfort right? We all like some comfort. It's very uncomfortable when you are speaking to people and they're like, say that again, say that again. <laughs> you actually want to say it to your people <laughs> who are saying amen instead of say that again, right? Um. So, so comfort is one of the things that uh, make us uh, do that. But but other than that, um, there is also the reality of, are you going to be allowed the audience? Um, is someone willing to share their pulpit with you? Um, so so there, there, there are different dynamics of that. Uh, for some people, yes, they are going to where it's comfortable. But I think for some people is, who's going to allow you the space? Because... You always have to find, um, uh, what would we call it? Um, is it a, a goodwill person? Um, there was a name. A person uh, of peace. Person of peace. Yes, yes. A person of peace who is willing to vouch for you and say, I know Velma, she is a lover of Jesus, and I know that she's capable um, of doing ministry here. And that's why I'm, honestly grateful to the United Methodist Church because it's one of the few churches in uh, in the diaspora that is willing to say, we believe in your ability, we believe in your ministry, we believe in your calling, and we recognize your ordination to do this work. Um, and, and they are not shy to say that we believe these pastors have what it takes to do ministry here. And so um, all this to say that it's it's easy to to do um, to to I, I think every time when a movement starts, it's always easier to go to the known. Um, I think this happened even with the New Testament church um, when the Christians broke from uh, Jerusalem, they went to other towns, but they were evangelizing other Jews in those towns, right? Yeah. Um, until I think Paul is the one who came and he was an apostle to the Gentiles and everybody was like, what? Um, you remember the, the, the situation they had with um, the, 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 the church. I think it was the church in Jerusalem who was like, come and explain to us, what is that again you are doing? Like you are actually sitting down and eating with uncircumcised Greeks. Um, and Paul was like, yeah, yeah. And so it takes, it takes a few people who believe God is calling them beyond um, to do that. And, and God anoints them to do that. But I think, I think what I would say, Velma, is that we should be willing when the Lord calls us into that to not cower and, and be afraid but to move in the authority of Christ to whatever other context God is calling us. That's awesome. I wanted to just jump and shout, but I'm like self-control. <laughs> I mean, that's so good. I'm about to maybe have some things, some thoughts to add. Yeah, she's already told us everything about it. I think it's just, when you look at it, 
the generally people like to go to places where they will be celebrated rather than tolerated. I like to go to a place where someone is going to say, welcome, pastor. And he's not going to look down on me and say, where did you say you went to school again? Did you, is that school accredited? Is it affiliated? Is it what? Is it, you know? And I have learned over time that there's more to pastoring than having good English, you know, speaking good English or even preaching good sermons. I remember one of our classes at Asbury earlier on, uh, we, we went to Korea and uh, South Korea, actually, with a group. And I remember telling some of my friends, listening to late Paul Yonggi-cho, who at that time had the largest single congregation. I'm like, his preaching is not even as good as the preaching of uh, a youth group leader at my church in Nigeria. That was what I said. But I came to that conclusion. It's, there's more to pastoring people than just being able to preach. So, so I think that if people remember that, then they are able to welcome ministers that don't, they may not even understand their accent and their language, but they know that this person has been called, is anointed to be a pastor. We would like to work with him. We would like to submit ourselves and cooperate together and do ministry. And what I've seen is that churches that do that, they, they can see the difference. But churches that just speak ministers because, oh, he looks like us, so we can stay with him. I have examples of such churches, they're almost dead. Because it's all about, okay, the familiar things. We don't want to leave our comfort zone. So these pastors are not going to challenge us. They're not going to tell us something strange. They're not going to tell us to come pray, chain prayer. You know, people don't like those kind of things. You know, I was raised in a, in a, a denomination where every month, apart from the weekly ones that they have, they gather at a place and you, you probably have 500 to a million people gathering on a Friday night and they are praying and singing. It's common in Lagos, Nigeria to see all these young people come to sing. Some of them don't even have a seat. They are standing for seven, eight, nine hours, jumping and dancing and singing and praising God. Some of them walked for miles to get to that place. And just like Susan talked about, that those struggles in their lives are the things that have made them strong and rather than being discouraged, not that we don't have depression and anxiety, it's just that people have too many things to, to deal with. They're praising God, they're worshiping God, they're praying. They pray those things out of their lives and they can't even remember. They don't have the time for that. So I think these are some of the gifts that if people are, are hospitable enough, and when I mean hospitality, I don't just mean say, oh, come, let's take a picture. When you wear your clothes, they say, oh, this is a very good, uh, I don't know what my wife, they used to call it uh, costumes. They call your, your clothes, the your clothes you wear to church. Every Sunday, someone is calling it a costume. You know, it's like you're just wearing this to, to show off something. It's like, this is my normal dress that I go to church with. So when people learn to appreciate what you have and what you bring, Rather than say, okay, let's just keep this person the next two years. Let them just bring us a real minister. This one, we don't know what they gave us, but let them bring us a real minister. So those are some of the struggles that we face. Uh, and that's why you hear people go stay with their people. Uh, well, during Christmas, the pastor gets all these gifts. In some of the places, nobody remembers to even say, Merry Christmas to the minister. You know, So those are some of the things that make people to want to go to the, the what they are familiar with, what they know, what they enjoy. And so 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 that's what, that's a major challenge today, even in the US and for some of our friends in other places, they've said that too. It has continued to be a major challenge for them that they see. And so we continue to push in, push in and wherever we're accepted, we go there. Wherever we're not accepted, Jesus said we should dust our feet and get out of the place. <laughs> so that's what some of us have been doing, what some of us have been doing uh, for a while. Wow, thank you so much. Somewhere I got interrupted there. Somebody was calling me and I was trying to reject the call and then I said I accepted the call. So. <laughs> okay, thank you all. So what would you say to an African, uh, maybe an Asian, a Korean pastor, 
who is here that God has called and they know that God has called them to all ethnicities in this nation or maybe in Europe, but they are really struggling because of how challenging it is. What would you tell them? Not to give up, you know. Um, I really like what Tunde said. Ministry is more than preaching. And so when we, or, or ministry is more than being smooth with language. Um, and so when we move beyond that, we are able to see gifts of people. We are able to see a peaceful spirit. We are able to see a good manager of God's resources. We are able to see a good leader who's leading people into a love of Jesus Christ. We are able to see somebody who's good at resolving conflict just because their spirit is so calm. We are, we are able to see someone who's loving all these children into the kingdom, not, not by blasting scriptures to them. I mean, sharing scriptures is good, but more than that, building relationships. Um, and so I believe when God sends you somewhere, um, even though you might face resistance for some time, um, God gives you the tools. God helps you navigate the road. Um, I don't know about your you all's experiences, but I know there are places I have gone to here. And, you know, the DS comes and says, I brought you the most wonderful pastor. <laughs> Welcome her. People are like, Yay, welcome. <laughs> and you can tell they are really struggling, you know. Um, but after one, two, three months, they are like, oh my gosh, tell them to never take you out of here. We love you. We love your ministry. We love what you're doing. We 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 see ourselves in you. It's the same faith, it's the same Christ. Um and and so I think if you would be chickened out uh, on that first week when everybody is coming and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, trying hard to tolerate you, um, and and I think we have become so aware of uh, people who are really trying hard and and people who are actually embracing many times. I'm very gracious with people because I'm thinking. Yeah, they are not sure who I am. They are not sure, um, um, you know, how I'm gonna fit in in their context. Um, but but I give them grace. I give them grace, and I and I pray. And within time, God, because God is the one who calls us, you know, uh, impacts it in them that it is really more than how people look. It is more about, remember the story of Samuel when he was going to anoint the king and God was saying, no, 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 that skip the physical appearances. I look deeper than that. And I believe it's the thing with ministry. God looks deeper. And for the people that he has endowed with the gifts and graces for ministry, um, I would say, keep on keeping on. Yeah, I was trying, you know, I was talking about visiting Young Church Church and I didn't conclude my thoughts. Just to follow up with what Susan was talking about, where I said, you know, I'm far away theologically from Young Cho, you know, faith and charismatic and uh, health and wealth gospel. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a denominator, it's a church that has thrived over the years. And I remember going there and I said, well, there, there has to be more to this growth than just preaching. And to see the amount of things that they did going to some of the past pastors, they have these cell groups where the ministers go to visit people at home, small church kind of things, neighborhood churches, follow up and prayers all the night. You know, everybody comes at five in the morning. They have another group at six. So I came, came out with that conclusion, much more than just preaching and smooth talk. There has to be the prayer. There has to be the follow-up. There has to be the genuine love for people 
which when which we see with many of our people from Asia, when we pastor, they, they love the people. Our African brothers know that they have to go visit and sisters visit in the hospital, talk to people, wait patiently for them. And like Susan said, sometimes they will come and say, we don't know this pastor, whether he's qualified or not. Someone came to me one time and said, you know, we don't, I don't know, don't call me again. We don't want anyone calling us. We, we have children that are older than you. Don't call us. You can't take care of us. Because I followed up to say, oh, I no. didn't see you, George, how are you doing? And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. But, you know, after, after some years, the same people don't want you to leave. The same people are willing to keep you. They talk to everybody that is needed to say, we want this person to remain here. And, and after months, they're still kind of like, oh, we really miss this pastor. So so I would say to someone who is feeling discouraged to say, like, like Susan said, is God sending you? And if he sent you, he will back you up. He will support you. And I used to have a pastor who says there's a difference between those who were sent and those who just went. And, uh, you <clears> know, <throat> so so when, when, when you have those challenges, is to remember whether you were sent by God. And if you're sent by God, is to hold on and keep the prayer. Maybe some spiritual warfare going on there, like we say in Africa, you may need to bind some demons somewhere and maybe the eyes of the people will be opened. But those are some of the gifts that we bring to the body of Christ. Being able to challenge spiritual forces, uh, you can call them psychological forces, but whatever it is hindering people from receiving the gospel of Christ, we should not be afraid of confronting those spiritual entities in the spirit and taking authority over them so that our people can be free to then listen to God's, the gospel of Christ. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, doing ministry in the diaspora, the cultures are different. And at times, even the theology are different. You just talked about the example of, of Young Church Church. How 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 do you stay culturally relevant as you do ministry here in the diaspora, but then theologically, uh, without compromising your theology? Uh, what are some of the things that are like, oh, these are my non-negotiables, and how do you do that? So bringing the discipleship major to, to open all the ground for that. <laughs> Um, well, I I think um, there is something Steve Bevans uh, talks about in his book, Constants in Context. Um, and he talks about bold humility. So be bold. Be bold uh, because you are carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it has power, it has authority, but be humble. <laughs> be humble and recognize that um, you are a student of culture. You know, you don't know everything. So be ready to listen to people. Um, let pe people guide you and show you. Honestly, sometimes it's the children and young people who teach me so much about culture um, and, and, and really about context because they don't have as much filters. Yes. You know, to say, don't, don't say that to pastor. No, they are going to say it to the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> they are the ones who will tell you, um, why are you doing this? You're like, oh, well, uh, shouldn't I do this? Then they will tell you why you shouldn't do what you're doing. Um, and so in terms of the biblical mandate, be bold, in terms of contextual things and cultural things and how to navigate the do's and don'ts from an emic perspective, I think, um, be humble, I would say. Awesome. I guess that sounds like the same thing I wanted to say is to just be willing to learn. Uh, so come into a different context, just be willing to learn and be gracious when, pe when people tend to push back. I think that sometimes people say things out of uh, ignorance, 
not because they hate you or because you know they are racist you know we live in a world where everything has been it's easy to to just give people labels you know when you give people labels you stop them from engaging with you so when someone says something instead of trying to understand why they said what they said it's cheaper much easier less tasking to say they are racist or they are liberals or they are wicked you know you just shut down the discussion but if you're willing to learn then you may need to take pay attention to why they did what they did and maybe ask some questions you may you may feel a sense of sympathy for them not knowing that there are aeroplanes in cameroon for example uh, someone thinking that you must have been swimming from kenya for a couple of months to get to america and there's very serious even when you answer in a very sarcastic way like oh yes I, i've been swimming and they're like oh how long would that take oh it took me about two months you see that they're sincere <laughs> it's just that they are sincerely wrong and so rather than getting angry and and just calling people name is to spend some time with them i was told that it's easier to judge someone when you've not sat down to listen to their stories and so listening to people's stories uh, the church that i'm presently at is this is my fourth year now that i'm trying to make some changes uh, but for the past three years plus i've been listening to stories trying to find out things that are important i met with a, a man who served the same church about 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, I asked him, he said, oh, there is a tree there. Don't go near that tree. That was the first thing he told me. I'm like, tree? What is the relationship of a tree to growing a church? But but, but trust me, that can mess up your church. If you keep arguing over cutting down a tree for the next six months and everybody's angry, you will be in trouble. So I think paying attention and learning becomes very important. But I also think that Declaring, like, like Susan talked about being bold, declaring where you stand about on, on issues. You may think that people will hate you for that, but I think people appreciate people who can stand for something. And uh, for me as a person, everyone around me, they know me as uh, an African person. I'm very traditional. I'm very orthodox, use the word orthodox. But I'm also someone who believes that the gospel for, is for everyone. And so my duty is to guide the people to be hospitable. And being hospitable is not just about saying, oh, we have somebody black in our church. You know, that's what people think when they want to talk about inclusivity or hospitability. Oh, we, I have a friend who is black. Oh, oh, I went to Kenya two weeks, some 10 years ago when I was in high school. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being genuine in the real sense of it. And being willing to accept other people's stories to be part of your own story. So rather than you know bifurcating and saying, this is my story and this is Verma's story, when we begin to be hospitable, people's stories become part of our own story. And that does, doesn't just happen in a day. And so I think that sitting down with leadership of the church, you know, talking together, letting them know your story, where you're coming from, you know why you hold some beliefs may be very important. What are your bases? Some of the things that I, I owe very dearly to me may not be Bible, but there are, there are stories that are behind those things. Why I, I pay, pay special time to praying, why I think I take time for discipleship. There are th reasons why I do some things with my kids because it was done to me. You know, I didn't like how it was done to me. And now my children had to pay the price for that. I remember <laughs> explaining why in my confirmation class, everybody has to sign. And someone said, why should they sign? They have to give it to their parents. The parents have to sign. And they have to commit to attending some of the sessions. And, they, and the, you know, what do you call them? The sponsors or mentors have to come. And someone asked me, I said, well, I, I can't say it's in the Bible, but I have a story. So I told them my story, how I was baptized as a child. And I have all these people who signed on my certificate. I've never met them since, since they signed that certificate. That was the last time they probably saw me. And now I'm almost 50 years old. I don't know them. I see the names on my certificate. They have never been part of my journey. And I said, that's not what the church did when people were baptized, when they were bringing their kids. There were those sponsors and godparents 
who took care of the children and discipled them until they prepared them for, for confirmation. So when I said, you know, if you're going to make me, I have to baptize this baby. I want to know who are the sponsors and I want to see them. They have to know what they're involved in. So there, there are things that we do because of the, the experiences we've had and making people know those experiences may help them to understand us better and they don't see you as being a big art or something, but because of your story. And so I think there are things that are non-negotiable. The word of God is non-negotiable for me. The authority, the lordship of Christ is non-negotiable. The, you know, the salvation of our souls, people must, they have to be led to Christ, accepting the work that was done on the cross. That is non-negotiable to culture, whether African culture or Western culture. But I think there are other things that may fall within that area where we can negotiate and explain things to people but paying attention to God's word, the authority of God's word, uh, I don't think those are negotiable for me as a person. Awesome.